Is there something that is more important than anything else to the church and the life of the church? I believe according to the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2 there is. Please pay attention to the coming message as we talk about that. Also at the close of this message, please notice my schedule of preaching events that are coming up. May God bless you and have a great day.
Do you think they said, okay, y'all send them on in there? No. They backed off and never pursued putting them there again. Because, why? Because MacArthur just stood his ground? No, because God's word is the last thing that this world wants to hear. They don't want to expose themselves or those like them to that. They hate more than they even hate you as a representative of Christ. They hate the world. Does not stay with me. Don't lose me here. They hate the truth of the word of God and will do anything in order to stamp it out and to get away from it. That is why churches and preachers and a people that teach preach, stand on, that's a biggie, and live the word of God are the most despised. But I'm going to tell you something. When you've got that kind of opposition coming against you from a worldly perspective and an anti-Christ regimen coming against you, then you know you're on the right track. Amen. That's how you know. Now I'll give you another one to think about and to consider. If this world likes it, a Christian had better run the opposite direction. Think about just in the way of television, in the way of what is being promoted through television, or even news, or the world system, or even trying to sell you a magazine or a car on television. I don't even know if there's anything to think of magazines anymore. I guess there is. But whatever the world comes through on the airways of your TV and the internet and your radio, if they like it, God's people better raise a red flag right there and say, wait. The world likes it. The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination unto God. So if the world likes it, the world pushes it, the world comes against it, you better run from what they're wanting you to go towards, and you better plant a stake if it's something they hate or despise. Did y'all hear what I said? Amen. Now, first and foremost among all that stuff is truth. Brother, sister, I'm going to tell you it's more important than anybody in this building knows about. It's more important for you to espouse the truth, for you to find a pastor that will come in here and teach you the truth of the word. Not just messages, not just little mini sermonettes, not just 25-minute bars so you can get out and get to the buffet on time, not just things to appease you and to feed your flesh. That is the last thing your flesh needs is to have faith. I'm talking from a spiritual standpoint now, is to have your flesh fed. You'll know you and I are to deny our flesh, put the flesh to death. You have to get people and truth in place in order to hear it, to stand on it, to believe it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you do that, listen to me, Lily. If you do that, that's going to put you straight in the crosshairs as a target from the enemy. Y'all okay with that? Y'all cool with that? Because that's what it's going to do. Now, the reason I ask if you're cool with that is because a lot of churches are. They'll say this, and have said it, and continue by the bucket ball to say it even more vigorously. Well, we can't have influence with the world if we're so dogmatic about sin. We can't have any kind of push or emphasis with the world and try to win them to Christ if we don't let them be the way they are. Hard wash. It is the very thing that the world can't stand in you, the word of God, the word of truth in Christ himself that draws the ungodly to Christ, not pushes them away. Let me tell you what will push them away if you act like them. You invite them to come on and in and drop nothing. You come in and say, well, you don't have to put anything down, put anything away. You can come on in and be a homosexual or a lesbian or somebody that shacks up or, or unmarried. And living you can do all those things. Nobody will wink at you. Nobody will say anything to you. I mean, you can live in sin and have Christ too. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. The truth is going to mark you it's going to put a target on you. And if you're okay with that, then God can do something and will do something. More incredible than any of us in here can imagine. But if you don't, if you're willing to just satisfy, be satisfied with being one of the dead fish that float downstream, not going against the tide, just not bucking the trend, just going along with this world and not causing any angst or agony for them, then God will say, okay, you do it. And you can't do it. Not if it's going to be God. You and 
I can't produce. We can't produce righteousness. We can't produce converse no matter how much you pray for somebody. You can't save anybody. You can be an instrument in them being saved, but the power's got to come from somewhere else. Hello? Okay. All right. Let's get into Galatians chapter 2 then. Here we go. Galatians chapter 2. This is the council at Jerusalem where Paul and Barnabas have come there, meeting with some church leaders. Council at Jerusalem took place around 50 AD, and I use the term AD and not this CE garbage because AD, Anno Domini, means the year of our Lord. I tend to stay with that because every year is his year, before or after. Here's what they're doing. They're coming together to understand and to conclude that the Gentile believers who are now converts to Christianity do not have to observe the Mosaic law and the traditions in order to be saved and remain saved. It's all of grace, nothing of works, period. That's what they're declaring and coming together to agree on. Now, chapter 2, here we go in verse 1. If you're in your Bible, read along. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of ready faces, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. He's basically just giving them a synopsis of what he's been doing, what he's been led to do by God, preaching the truth, and that's what he's confessing to them that he and Barnabas have done. Now he says, but neither Titus, verse 3, who was with me being a Greek, that means Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. In other words, he was not circumcised. If you remember, that was a mark of the Jewish or Judaistic tradition of faith handed down by our crew Moses, that the male should be circumcised, and that was a, 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 a sign that he belonged to the family or the kingdom of God, God's people. Well, you're God's people now by grace through faith, plus nothing. I don't see non-Gentiles in here. I don't know, but I don't see any that I can tell. I don't know if there are any or not. I don't think so. But how is it you come in? Paul says it's by grace. According to Ephesians 2, 2, he says it's by grace, through faith that you're saved, and that, even the faith that's involved is not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works. Circumcision was a work. Any kind of time you try to produce from a human means or a human effort or a human standpoint, even I want to get there so bad, I've got to believe you, got to believe, you can't produce that. It has to be produced in you. Not by works, lest, and here's why you can't do it by works, lest any man should boast. Ain't every one of y'all, forget the bad English, they can boast in the fact that you saved yourself or you came one day and you got right, you got no, you were drawn to the cross of Calvary if you're saved at all in here. You were birthed by the Spirit of God into the family of God by sovereign saving grace. And if you're in at all, that's how it happened. Not one of us, myself, none of y'all can say, Whoo, I did something to help get me saved. Ain't so, that's what he's declaring here. So let's pick back up with it. He says in verse 4, And that because of false bread, and oh, what did I just tell y'all in the introductory portion? You're always going to be a target. You're, if the truth is being, God's truth, and that's the only truth there is. If God's truth is being poured out, you are going to come under attack. No stopping it, no avoiding it. It may be heavy this time, it may be light, or even sometimes unnoticeable. But there's always a churning of the kingdom of darkness, and that's often worked out through people of an attack against the things of God, especially the truth of the Word of God. That's where it starts. He said they were false brethren, verse 4, <laughs> unaware, brought in, who came in privily. See, that's how the enemy does came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. 
See, every church, every people, every pastor or teacher or evangelist or missionary that is sound and teaching and preaching and believing the truth of the Word of God has the blessing and the approval of God on it because, after all, that's all you can do from God's perspective. It's His way or no way. However, you look on the other side of that coin now, brother and sister, that is the very thing that the, the devil, the demons of hell, and the world system cannot have. They don't care if you have a fine building. They don't really care if you have 500 people coming. The world and the enemy, listen to me now. They couldn't care less if you get together and love on each other and have pork chops and steak and mashed potatoes or whatever every time you meet. They couldn't care less about that. They couldn't care if you have a $20 million building here and 50 acres to go with it. The world didn't care about that. They will pitch a fit if you start declaring the truth and expecting people to do it how God says do it. Can't stand that. Are y'all with me? Can't stand it. And there are a lot of people who think they're going to heaven because they did something in there yesterday. Well, if that's what you're relying on, you better recheck. If you're relying on something that you did to help get you saved, By grace, through faith, that not of yourselves, gift of God, let any man to birth. That's pretty clear. That's as clear as it can get. And when he says this in verse 5, listen. To whom? He's talking about these bunch of nutballs that were trying to derail the truth. The brethren unaware, false brethren, verse 4. The planted seed of the enemy, in other words. He says, to whom we gave place by subje subjection? No, not for an hour. We didn't give place to subject. We didn't give them any uh, credence. We did not submit to their ungodly lies of heresy. He says, we didn't give it to them, not even for an hour. We stuck true to the word of God. Here's what he says. That the truth, verse 5, look at it. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Truth divides. Don't you remember the Lord himself plainly tells us that the word of God is like a what? Sharp what? Two-inch two sword. That's right. Cutting, dividing the sun between the joints and the marrow, the soul and the spirit. It's a cutter. The truth of the word of God cuts. It cuts away that which is foul and ungodly and cankered and reveals that which is pure and holy and right and righteous so that the Lord can bless. The Word of God is uncomfortable. And I despise some of these guys who get in the pulpit or behind the lectern and never, ever cover anything that is really what the people listening to it need. I could get up here and tell you how good you are. And some of you are good, I'm sure. Good. You live morally, basically good, clean lives. As should every child of God. But it is not the morality or the basic goodness or cleanliness that is the issue here. That is the important issue. Now God, through his Holy Spirit of sanctification, he is going to produce good stuff. Amen? He is. But now don't rely or think that what you and I come up with is good. See, you've got to announce good as what God says is good. Heard one guy put it this way. He says, I don't know if the Lord blessed that person or the devil blessed him. Ooh. You, don't, you say, the devil can't bless him. Oh, yes, he can. Yes, he can. Don't you remember the temptation of the Lord Jesus himself? He says, Jesus, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you, and he showed him supernaturally all the kingdoms of the world. Don't you all remember that? Under the gospel. Why can he say that? Because he has authority to do that. God gave it to him. It's temporary. He's the God, little G, God of this world. But yeah, he can do supernatural things. But he was dealing with the Son of God on this occasion. And he couldn't tempt him or test him because everything, period, belongs ultimately to God Almighty. Oh, folks, do you understand 
that what God says is good and what the world says is good may not necessarily line up. So the world will tell you this is good, you need it. And if God says, no, it's not good, you don't need it. I'll tell you about the buddy, the, the, the preacher that told the story. He says, what well, somebody thinks is a good godsend, you've heard that term, God, this is godsend. Oh, she was a godsend. May not be good, and God didn't send you. Remember what you're in. Remember that you are in the midst of a struggle in this life between the forces of darkness and the forces of light. And whichever one you submit to is who, is who you're going to be lined up with. Even as a Christian. You do know that sometimes God's people, either ignorantly or willingly, can be used of the enemy in a mighty way. Y'all do know that, right? Y'all with me this morning? Is this boring, y'all? I hope not, because this may be some of the most vital stuff some of you have heard. We're cutting away all the worldly fluff and nonsense about what it is to be church and to pursue God's agenda as church. And if you ain't got the truth as far, I know y'all don't have a pastor. I know I don't have a clue what you're doing as far as trying to find one or look for one, but I'm telling you, however long it takes, however much effort and prayer and struggling in tears, you better do, Lily, and you need to do, you better do it until God says the one that's going to proclaim his truth to you. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Don't waste your time. You ain't got that much of it as it is. And I'm not talking about because some of you are older. I'm older too. I'm not talking about that. The Bible tells us clearly that we're to make the most of every opportunity. Because the days are filled with evil. Sure hope you're making the most of your opportunity. You say, well, they ain't, can't find nobody. Ain't nobody in there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you going to tell me that God is still not calling pastors after his own heart to preach and to teach? We can't pay him 80000 a year. I know that. A guy that said it for real will worry about that. Amen. You pursue Jesus' agenda, and he will pursue his agenda for you. I'm telling you, that's the way it works. Or you could come and get some guy in here. And I say that because I'm in a bunch of different churches. We're we bounce around different places. I see a lot of stuff, hear a lot of stuff. I've pastored seven churches. I've seen glorious things from God in all of them. And I've seen some agony and distress and ugliness in pretty much all of them. Amen. But I'm telling you, a people, how they stand and what they stand on determines whether God's on them or not. You say, we're in church, we've been here. I know, well, I know Billy's been here, and I know that you gather as church, but what are you really after? Is it truth at all costs, no matter what it costs? Or is it just trying to meet and hang on because, after all, our great granddaddies put it together and they built the building and put the cemetery and all that? you got to move beyond that. Beyond that. Because you ain't got much time. None of us do. In a relative span, we just don't. You got a community that I guarantee you everybody in this building can point and almost throw a rock. I don't even have to know the statistics to know. Almost throw a rock to find somebody that is not of independence of this church or not saved. Am I correct in that? Amen. Of course I am. I've been there doing this a lot. Everywhere's like that. Are we okay with that? Have we come to the place that? People, and I've heard this said to me by church members that I've pastored. Well, we've been there 14 different times, and I guess they're just never going to come. We'll go 15. Amen. Go 15. Go 16. Have a special prayer meeting for that guy. Woo! Amen. <laughs> Have a special get-together for that couple. Why? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, woman, boy, or girl, availeth much. We don't know what God's up to. We don't know what He's doing. We don't have the same time frame 
that he does in this work. You know, we, we want to be a strong church preacher. Well, there's one how you do it, one way how you get there. That's it. If you believe the truth, you get somebody that preaches the truth, you stand on the truth, and that's going to put you at odds, but that's okay. If you're on the side of God, you're going to be against that which is evil. And evil, listen to me, I'm going to kind of close it down here because I want to continue with this later on. Maybe next time, I don't know. If you continue to pursue the things of God, it is automatically putting you at odds with others. It just automatically does that. You don't have to wait for it. Have y'all noticed? It's true too. Have y'all noticed that when maybe you got saved, think about your own testimony. When you got saved, the folks that you used to run around with and hang out with and pile around and go to this joint over here with, have you noticed there was something different now? For one thing, you didn't want to and they still wanted to. Have you noticed that they looked at you different and started talking about you differently than they used to? And here's why. There is something different. Whereas you used to be dead, now you're alive. They're still dead. Light and dark don't get along in the same room. Bitter and sweet cannot proceed both from the same fountain. And this is true too. It's not true. It's not that you'll have to cut your worldly friends away. If you get right with God, you know what's going to happen? They're going to say bye bye to you. They'll cut you out. They'll cut you away. Because you're floating in a different pond now. You're not okay with what they're doing. And on occasion, you may, if you've got any guts at all, verbalize that. Say, God loves you, and I'll pray for you. And, and I want you to get what I've got. And I want Jesus to come in. They can't stand up to that unless God's already started dealing with them. They'll cut you out. They'll say, he's got to go. You're an alien down here. Your church is foreign. You're an impediment. If you're a Bible-believing, fundamentally sound, Christ-seeking church, you're an obstacle. And only those who identify with you can love you and appreciate you if you're really pursuing the things of God. And at the very beginning, middle, and end of that is the truth of the word of God. I'll read verse 5 to you again. To whom? The bunch of nuts that were coming against them, trying to get them caught up in false teaching. To whom? We gave place by subjection? No! Not for an hour! That the truth, there it is, the truth of the gospel might contend with you. It's vital. It's precious. It's also cost. Will you pay? Will you pay? I hope it's that you will. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much this day again. Lord, for your precious truth, your blessings, your goodness to us, for the wonderment that is contained not only in being blessed by reading the truth of the Word of God, but by living it. Oh, Lord, what you build upon when we simply sell out to you and obey the truth and promote it and seek it out and seek men who will teach it and preach it. Lord, there's no limit to what your blessings can look like if a people or an individual or a family, man, woman, husband, wife, will do that. But if we do that, there's going to be opposition. I'm reminded of the parable of the sower, Lord, where their seed falls on different kinds of soil, and one falls on the ground that is stony, rock. And it comes up and endures, endures for a while, but the, the scorching heat comes against it and just kind of fades away. There are so many in the church that will be hot and on fire for God for a while, but until when persecution comes, their enemy attacks it, they fall away, they can't be found anymore. They were never really real to begin with, oftentimes. Not every time. Sometimes they're there and they're just going through a tough time, but sometimes they're just not legitimate to begin with. But 
more of that soil that found the seed that was good and it produced fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. That's what we want to be. There has to be a receptive nature to that soul. There has to be a receptive heart to get to the truth. To long. Some people are in church and been there for years, don't even know what the real truth of doctrines of the basic doctrines of the Bible and of the fundamentals of the church are. They may have never been told. And I used to marvel at that more than how many people go for 40 years and never hear the word of God, but sometimes preachers who have been doing it for 40 years don't know it. And won't preach it. If they do know it. Oh Lord, raise up a generation of either young guys or older guys that believe you and will teach it and preach it no matter what folks want to or need to according to them here. Please do it, Lord, in these last days of the church. We need you desperately. And we need the truth desperately.